Welcome to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. I'm Ted Bonnet. I mean, I'm Phil Proctor. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's raining out there. I don't know. I've got to... But, ah, whew, I'm sorry. I had to get out of that water. Well, we risked our life and limb for this show. Yeah, we're broadcasting in, in, in the rain outside with an umbrella. What happens if the water hits the mic? Up, 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 up. Ellis, you know what I mean? <laughs> You Thank know, God there's no lightning storm. <laughs> today we have with us, and the reason we came in is because Fritz Coleman's our guest, and uh, weatherman Fritz Coleman. And, and Fritz wanted to thank you for uh, coming down to the station to answer some questions. I'm honored to. You know. As long as none of them involve meteorology, we're oh, good. Oh, great. Because you don't know anything about meteors? No, I relinquish my license, and by law, I can't answer any questions about it. If people ask me about weather, I say, look on your phone and never ask me. Anything. I don't think you can use the word weather. <laughs> if. Well, if. there you go. We spent all that money for the green screen and everything. Yeah. <laughs> can you do some gesturing at least? Of course. Okay. Smooth gestures and a pleasant smile. 40 years. That's the gig. <laughs> Vanna White with maps. There I am. <laughs> That's right. And, of course, you started... As a stand-up comic, that's exactly correct. Right? How did you How did you get from stand-up comic to a really revered weatherman? You were on the air what thirty-two years? Forty. Uh, Forty. I, I, years I retired ago. two weeks shy of my fortieth anniversary. Wow! At NBC. So wow. this is a true story, but real we'll be the judge of that. Hate this story. Okay. So I came out here in 1980 to do comedy, and I worked my way up to being a paid regular, such as it was at the comedy store. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friend that worked at NBC, he was a reporter and an anchor man at NBC, brought his boss, who was the news director at the time, and his boss's wife down to see me do a show at the store on a Friday night. Cool. And so I talked on stage about having started my broadcasting career in Armed Forces Radio and Television. Ah. And while I was in the Navy, I was forced to do the weather Against my will. Oh, really? And the fact that I knew nothing about weather didn't seem to <laughs> phase the, the Defense the Department. Of they course care. not. Just make sure your shoes are shining. And please don't use profanity on the air. That's all it was. <laughs> so I told this. That's the same rule here. It's the same. <laughs> yeah. Damn it, it is. So. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, I did this show, and I went backstage afterwards to meet this man. Steve Antonetti, God rest his soul, I'll never forget in my own, my career. And he said, this is a very odd question, but do you have any desire to come to Channel 4 and do some vacation relief and vacation fill-in work uh. for me? Uh, I've got a main weatherman who is Kevin O'Connell, the guy that took Pat Sajak's place. Uh, he hasn't had a vacation in a year. I need some help down there. Yeah. Would you have any desire? And I... I was making $25 a set, as you know, yes, at the right. comedy store, and I, I almost passed out. I said, when do you want me to start? And, <laughs> and may I carry your wife to the car? Yeah, Is there right. anything I can... <laughs> so uh, he said, well, you have to audition. And I said, okay. I said, you, you do remember me saying from the stage that I don't know anything about weather. He said, perfect. There's no weather in California. This will work out great. Right, right. No weather so in California. So uh, I, I did the vacation relief and the fill-in work for two years, and then I was bumped up to the main weather job. And, I, I mean, I am just the, the beneficiary of the greatest amount. I always wow. say that my, I, in my life was the greatest amount of luck since that woman was discovered at Schwab's Pharmacy in the 40s. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. And I'm very fortunate. Well, this maybe is why we, I've always heard that oh, weather in L.A. is a joke. Yeah. <laughs> well, but the thing is, Fritz, it's not just L.A. You've got the, you got the desert, you, right? you yeah. got the mountains. Yeah, well, that, the that, that's ocean. the whole thing. People, the people in the, particularly people from Chicago yeah. who are very protective of the fact that they have the worst weather in the United States. And you don't have any. You don't know what to – how you call drizzle a storm? Yeah, yes, well, right. technically it's it is right. a storm. But, but you have nine climates out here. You have the uh, wow. northern and southern coast. Yeah. You have the coastal and inland valleys. You have the northern and southern mountains. And you have the upper and lower desert. And all of those people, people in Apple Valley, don't give a crap what the weather is in Brentwood. Right. They want to know what it is in their town. And the reason is, is because people in Apple Valley aren't getting rain today. They didn't get it yesterday. No, that's, that's the thing. I mean, you, you can have... That's why they came up with a system. What, what do you mean by a 30% chance of rain? Yeah. And that, that's just a cover your bases forecast. That means that wherever you are in our viewing area, it could be rain. there's a 30% chance that you'll get wet. Yeah, right. And there's a 70% chance you won't, but we choose to say 30%. Yeah, and, that, and that is a tricky thing about the weather forecasting in L.A. because when you read the National Weather Service forecast, they're trying to average 
six microclimates. No, so, that's exactly what they're doing. And, and not only that, yeah. when we have a something, well, you, you could have drizzle in L.A. and it can be catastrophic. First of all, yeah. it, it can be just the four-tenths of an inch of rain, you need to topple that oak tree under your car Yeah, because the roots have been wet for three years That's right. and haven't had a chance to dry out. People don't know how to drive on the freeways out here, so it can just be a, a minor spritz yeah. and people um, and and people can drive too fast and not slow down. So we have a lot of interesting... Especially uh, if it doesn't rain for months and months and months. No, exactly. You get that residue on the freeways. The oil. No, that's exactly what it is. The emissions. It's well, like there's ice. A, there's another thing about uh, L.A. When I was first out here with this play, The Amorous Flea, which came from New York, a great musical, I was living in the Hollywood area. The play was at Las Palmas, and I lived in like a, a, a little apartment on Vista del Mar. View of the sea? No. no. <laughs> View of the concrete. And uh, I had the afternoons off, so I walked over to the Egyptian theater to watch a movie. And in the film, there was a thunderstorm in the in the plot, and I, I noticed the water was was coming down on me in in on my seat here in the theater, and I looked and I saw that water had run all the way down the aisle to the exits at the on either side of the screen, wow. and there was a garbage can floating in water <laughs> there, and there's a thunderstorm going on in the screen. I said, oh "My God, smell a vision, you know, and now rain a vision." No pressure. You know? So yeah. I get up and I walked out to the lobby, and there's a chandelier in the lobby. And it's pouring water, wow. water, and they've got pans out and everything. I realized in California, it never rained, so you never had to fix your roof. No, exactly. Right? right. These things don't present themselves until there's catastrophic amounts of rain. <laughs> that's right. and every, no, that's and right. Every, and everybody always says, you know, you people in California. And, well, the fact of it is I, when I moved from New York, I didn't understand that either. But then I started telling my friends back east, California has – it's very it's it's you have 350 days of absolute paradise yeah. and then you have 15 days of biblical cataclysm right <laughs> right <laughs> and, and that's what, and because you have this pacific yeah. ocean that yeah. brings incredible amounts of moisture so a rainstorm in in california is a different animal and, and you just brought up a great point people would say um, why? Why? I mean, you got all oh, you had satellites and dopplers and all this stuff why, why do you get it wrong so often yeah. i said because Weather comes west to east in the northern hemisphere out of the uh, Gulf of Alaska mm -hmm. and southeast down, northern California first, us last. And weather acts differently over water than it does over land. So we look at it out in the ocean mm -hmm. and we say, okay, well, it seems to have this personality. But when it hits the topography of Southern California, the mountains yeah. and everything, and it upslopes and does all kinds of stuff, it acts differently. So yeah. we take a good shot at it. The people east of us, like when the weather comes ashore in California and it's acted a certain way over land, by the time it gets to Phoenix and then Chicago and then New York, people can see it coming over land and it's a little more solid forecast. You know? yeah. yeah, and and, and you're right. It's like there it, the diversity, of topography, and climate yeah. is yeah. is a st is wonderful about LA. I mean, it's just you can yeah. drive a half an hour into Malibu and you're in another world. Yeah, and because of the mountains and all, it changes everything. And when the moisture hits the mountains, we have coastal mountains. It's even worse in Santa Barbara. That's why they get flooding up there because yeah. they have the San Ynez Mountains right yeah. next to the water, and it upslopes there, and that's why you get insane amounts of water right by the coast. So, well, you know, it uh, for me when we get into this weather. <clears throat> All I do is I just because of the localized forecasts are sort of impossible. I just look at the uh, the radar on the national weather forecast. That's all you have to do, and you just see what's coming yeah. at you, yeah. you the in band. the moment. You get a radar app. You, Here I come mean, the it, band. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> seriously. So this, you know, and, and and speaking to someone who's not a meteorologist, let me ask you a question about <laughs> weather. I mean. <laughs> Let's put it this way, anecdotally at least, all the thirty years you did weather forecasting here in the market, um, have you ever seen has the has the character of the weather intensified uh, in your in your view? Yes, uh, pe people. I, I do speaking engagements, and okay. I do a question and answer period at the end of the speaking engagements. And the single uh, most frequent question I get is, "Do you believe in climate change?" And I sure. say. I do believe in climate change. There are two areas of discussion in climate change. You can believe in the fact that the climate is changing, or are you asking me if there's man-made climate change? Mm, right. And I say, well, I believe there is, 
And uh, but I I'm I'm not an expert in that area. I, I don't work at JPL or anything. But uh, but I can tell you that things have changed. And here's what I know from doing the weather for 30 and 40 years. All of the measuring points of weather, temperature, barometer, wind speed, everything has become exaggerated and metastasized and, and yeah. accelerated and I don't know mm. if it's a if it's a uh, a frequent thing like a millennial thing every thousand years we mm -hmm. get there I don't know the answer to that question but I can tell you over the last 10 years we've broken every major record weather in the United States That's right. amount of rain frequency of tornadoes severity of tornadoes frequency of hurricanes severity of hurricanes rainfall amounts heat 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 Insane heat up Around in the Seattle. Entire world. Yeah, and in the Pacific Northwest, uh, which you're familiar with, and yes, your friends are familiar with. I, I mean, they had like it was in, in Seattle or in Portland. So there was like 105 degrees for That's the first right. time in yeah. recorded and history. nobody had air conditioning. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so everything is changing now. When you want to get into an explanation of that, I am not. I'm not qualified to answer. Well, well, but I, I do uh, think here. Here and here's here's how yeah. I end my discussion, and I'll finish with this. I say, but if we're not sure how much of it is man-made, shouldn't we protect ourselves in case some of it is? Yeah. I mean, can't we have electric cars? Can't we go to non-carbon-oriented fuels just to be safe, just to do our part? Yeah. So if it turns out, you know, at least we tried. It's like having a child, and he turns out to be a juvenile delinquent and has many felonies. But I was, I, I tried as a father. I, yeah. I, I did what I could, and so some of it is not right responsibility. Well, you know, I know that it's, it's uh, human-made because this condition is caused by uh, the baby, El Nino. Mm -hmm. the, the little uh, Latino baby mm -hmm. who is uh, heated up the water mm -hmm. out there and causing all this havoc. So mm -hmm. now that's... Well, that, that's where El Nino came from, and you're exactly right about that. Yeah. You, you, you know, it, it, it was El Nino, the, 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 before they had scientific analysis of it, right. started off the coast of South America, where every seven or eight years, the fishermen down there noticed that they were getting a bounty of fish that didn't normally dwell in those waters, uh -huh. like types of tuna and all that kind of stuff, because the waters were warmer. warmer. El Nino was uh, temperatures being one or two degrees warmer than normal, and, and La Nina is the opposite, where temperatures are Which lower. they say we're going towards. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you, um, last question about weather, I promise. Um, Sorry. Right. Um, did you ever have terminology like atmospheric rivers back in your no, day? No, no. When I started, it was called the Pineapple Express. Oh, yeah. It still but isn't it, like in Hawaii. They call yeah, it yeah. But, but it, it, it and I can re I can give you this fact now because I'm no longer a practicing weatherman, so I can tell you the truth. You were practicing all the time you were yes, doing. Yes, I was practicing. <laughs> I never did. We never got the tech rehearsal. When I was, <laughs> but um, but uh, you know they 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 want terminology that scares the crap out of you. Right. You know mm -hmm. and and. You know, a Pineapple Express sounds like a juice bar at the food court. <laughs> Let's go to the Pineapple Express for a smoothie. No, wait, you need an mm -hmm. atmospheric <laughs> river. You're going to be up the atmospheric river without a paddle yeah. if you don't sandbag your home. Yeah. <clears throat> so it, it's, it's um, it, you know, quite honestly, it, it's uh, the technology and forecasting weather is advancing. They have all these satellites. They have infrared photography. They can see how much moisture is in a, in a pocket of air. And so they, they, we do have these atmospheric rivers, which have always been there. We just didn't know how to right. describe it. Describe <clears throat> you know. it. So, it's, so the term atmospheric river is more of a branding for something that has existed. Yes. We used to have areas two or three times a year of extremely cold, dry air. But that's not good. That doesn't scare people. So now we have the polar vortex. Yeah. And it sounds like you don't want to be caught in the polar vortex with your family because you'll never be heard from again. I did voices for that movie. Yeah. The other one, I, which I love, is a bomb cyclone. That yeah. was a big one. Oh, yeah. A that, bomb yeah. cyclone is just rapidly dropping low pressure. Yeah. A bomb cyclone sounds like something we should be lobbing at the Houthis. We, we, you know? yeah, 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 that's right. But, or, but, you know, go, go into the shelter. Yeah, yeah you seriously. Know. You know. Wow. Anyway. You do a podcast mm -hmm. with Louis uh, Palenker right. uh, called Called, uh, what is it called? Media Path. Yeah, Media Path. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about media. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> we, we came up with a name because what we do is, Weezy and I have been friends for years. She produced one of my one-person shows 30 oh, years ago. Oh, I didn't know that. Great. And uh, 
we are of similar minds when it comes to the stuff. We love documentary films. We love new films. We love books, and we talk a lot. And she said, well, why don't you come on, and we'll just do a show about the stuff you and I talk about anyway. So uh, we, we start each show with, um, with giving suggestions of newly released media stuff, like streaming or cable or books or music. Yeah. And I'll, for instance, the, the one we did last week was uh, I did the... Uh, the uh, MLK uh, uh, Malcolm X new series of documentaries, the, part of the Genius series on Nat Geo, produced by Ron Howard's company. Ah. I don't know if you, it, it, the one they did on Picasso and Einstein oh, was yes, unbelievable. And this is like a five, but yeah, this is a really good one. It's like a, they do a split screen between both of their lives. Wow. And although they were of different minds on how to accomplish black equality, Martin Luther King was the, you know, he was the, he was the vanguard. He, he was the vanguard and he was the, he was the Gandhi. He wanted to know, Absolutely. but, and, uh, and Mahatma Mal is off to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank and, you. and Malcolm was by any <laughs> means necessary, including whatever it took, you know? Yep. So anyway, they did this thing. So I, that's what I, that was my offering. She did one uh, about a book and then we had a guest on, we had a great guest last week. who was the director of this new Rob Reiner uh, film called, uh, God and Country, which is about the rise Christian nationalism of metastasizing of yeah. Christian nationalism, wow. and it's a fantastic film. So that's what we do. Where is, and it, where is that available? Uh, it's it's being released in. I think it's going to be at the Landmark Theater like next weekend in Westwood. Good for them. But also, it's going to stream somewhere. But it's I don't such remember. an interesting wow. time. I mean, it's so wow. weird. This is a beautiful film. Uh, it's so mm. it, it's it's thoughtful. It doesn't bash Christianity. And as a matter of fact, the director uh, makes a great comment at the beginning. This is not anti-Christian. This is not. Uh, this is not telling you not to allow your your faith to dictate your politics. It's when you entwine the two and you can't tell the difference between one and another. Smart. Speaking of which, I mean, um, you today you had eggs at lunch, and I was thinking, wh whose children are those eggs? <laughs> Oh, you, when I had uh, the uh, scrambled eggs. Yeah, the scrambled eggs, because we're talking, scrambled, of course, about Alabama. Alabama. And is their insane scrambled, ruling. Scrambled, scrambled people. Yeah, that, that embryos are now have personable rights. Yeah. And personage, personage. Oh, my God. And, um, scrambled chickens. And this, this, you know, this is a direct, and there was a lot of Christian terminology in, oh, yeah. in, in the, in the yeah. law, yeah. or whatever we want to call it. It'll, of course, be challenged, but the this is what's going on. This is the question. It why, is. They, 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 they picked the, the current fight, the, the current weapon is abortion. Mm -hmm. But going back, um, you know, they always say that the, uh, the Tea Party movement was a reaction to Obama. But it was never, it, they never spoke the quiet part out loud. Yeah, it's right. always been ra based on racism. Yes. So part of the Christian nationalist movement started after Brown v. Board, when white people wanted to have private schools for their kids, not to give them a better education, but and they would never say it this way, but it was to take kids out of schools with African-American children. Right. So it, it was all based on racism. And they, they go through this, and they have very scholarly people. They have ex-evangelists. Jealous, evangelist, and there's one of the, I don't know who said it, but it's worth watching the movie for this. This guy said, why is why has Donald Trump been picked as God's choice to run this movement? And they said, because if you look at his presentation and the way he dresses and his hair, he's like a televangelist. His delivery is like a televangelist, the way he dresses, the way he asks for money. It's all like one of those guys, He's Jimmy Swaggart. And I thought, wow, that's brilliant. He has a scandalous life, yeah. like all yes. the televangelists. No, no, they yeah. like many of them, absolutely. And I thought, God, that's brilliant. That personality seems familiar to those people because they're used to watching him for four hours on a Sunday morning. You know, that's all well and fine. Point. But what bugs me about it is that I'm compelled, we're all compelled to pay for this because they have tax-exempt status. That's what and kills I me. Thought, I thought the, the, the agreement was you don't cross the church and state line. Exactly. And I, I asked this of the director. I said, I thought that if you spoke politics from the pulpit, mm -hmm. 
Your church would lose your tax-exempt status. He said, that started going away with the guy from Liberty University. What was his name? Oh, uh, Pat Robertson. Pat, Pat Robertson, because he's the guy that got out there, and he wanted to be the, the spokesman for this new uh, moral majority. Mm -hmm. that's right. And that's when it started, and he was never taken to task for it. And I thought, uh -huh. I, I thought, and sometimes, and they have clips in there where ministers say, I don't want Democrats in this church. If a Democrat comes into this church, it's because the devil made his way in here. And I thought, oh, my God. Yes, oh, my God. Unbelievable. Oh, God? This, is, this is sort of a perversion of the deregulatory uh, no, it past really we've is. had. You know, because I just watched, uh, it's going away on Netflix soon, Vice. Yeah. Christian Bale playing. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, that was brilliant. You know, I just watched it again. It's so prescient because yeah. if you watch yeah. Vice now, yeah. you see the groundwork being oh, laid yeah. for what's going on right now. Yeah, the neocons and all that stuff. And, and you know, one of the many, many beautiful things Adam McKay, wrote, you know, when he wrote this yeah. thing, one of the things he mentions is that by blowing out the fairness doctrine, Reagan, oh, yeah. by blowing out the broadcast fairness doctrine, gave birth to Fox News and the politicization absolutely. of information. Absolutely. And look what it has done. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Uh, no more, uh, you didn't, you know, e the equal time provision when you had a political ad, you had to follow it by right. a one of equal length uh, from the opposing, the opposing party. party. Forget about and it. And when you were, and I started when that was still happening. So yeah. I had to be, as a broadcaster, I had to be very careful about the information I disseminated because I knew that anyone could challenged. call and challenge me. Right. So you were trying to avoid the challenges by being balanced. So it was a self-policing environment that went away. Yeah. It's all under the umbrella of the Reagan deregulation. Yeah. And uh, I work for the Salvation Army, and they have a big homelessness mandate where they investigate it and try to find solutions for it. And they did this survey and it said the top three reasons for homelessness are number one, mental health, number two, drug addiction, and number three, rent. Yep. Which is mind-blowing. Yeah. And the Supreme Court just disallowed yeah. uh, the, the ability of somebody. They actually took away rent control in California and New York. Did you know that? Yeah. Well, they overrode. Just today. I, no. Today? Yeah. Yeah. What, wow. what happened? Oh, okay. Well, I have to find it on my you know, because iPhone. The, they because did, I can't remember anything without my iPhone. <laughs> they did over, you know, they, they, the landlord movement did override the municipals, municipalities here in L.A., I'm, I'm sorry, in California, on the state level. And that's what has restricted wow. rent control laws. Yeah. Um, and I, there was an article, I think, in one of the big papers yesterday about Hudson Valley, New York. And these, you know, this is a fairly depressed area. It's n it's not a garden spot, mm -hmm. and um, especially in terms of architecture and homes and all that. And these people are being blown out. You know, two thousand dollars for a, a you know a month for a, a one a bedroom. No, you know, mm -hmm. and and it's just this unfettered soulless greed, this spiral. Yeah, and it's yeah like, no, I don't know how hundred percent. You know, but the Reagan thing, uh, and not deregulation. He just dismantled the whole uh, public uh, mental health care system in the state where we had places like Porterville, and they had places that were mandated by the state where people could get the help they need, and they're not in jail for drug addiction. They're being treated. In a mental health facility. So that whole thing is a nightmare. Oh. And making the police be, you know, yes, and not trained for it, and not trained for mental health work. Well, we have a lot of improvement to make. Yeah. Uh, well, but we, we don't have all day to solve this problem. No. Let's get on. <laughs> no, but you can help uh, support uh, conversations like this. Yes, on and by a the station way, this like is, this. Uh, Phil and Ted's sexy boomer show. And uh, I'm Phil Proctor. I'm Phil Proctor. I'm Ted and you're Ted. It's you're Ted Bonnet. Yeah. And I'm, and, and I'm not Ted Bonnet. Yeah. Help right. us out. And but and we have Fritz Coleman, who uh, is Fritz Coleman. Fritz Coleman. Although when you were a DJ, you had another name. I was uh, my, my my boss. Can I say? Can I tell the story? Yeah, I think okay. you can tell. Sure. Uh, my boss, when I was in Buffalo, New York, and I was a DJ. Uh, my name is Fritz, which is. All the, I'll give you the story of my name, so you realize that I don't have that much an emotional attachment to the name. But okay. all the all the men in my father's side of the family were named Frederick, and my grandfather were fifty percent German in my family. But in the seventeen hundreds, not in gee, that's almost half. Not in Third Reich era, you right. know. But uh, he would call me Fritz 
because Fritz in German means little Frederick. And my grandfather would call me Fritz to distinguish me from my father, whose name was actually oh, Frederick. Like a junior, my, right? That's all it is, right? So, but he hated, my boss in Buffalo, New York, hated that name because he said, Fritz sounds like a Nazi camp guard. Nobody working on my radio station is going to call himself Fritz. No, yeah, Fritz, yeah, Fritz. <laughs> so I had to, I came up with uh, two other parts of my name. Jay was my first initial and then Frederick was my middle name. And, and so that's, that's the You were Jay wow. Fred Muggs? Yeah, yeah, I, God bless him. Back when TV was good, yeah. J. Fred. How many people out there in the audience uh, remember J. Fred? Ooh, 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 yeah. Mugs and Dave, Ga- uh, Dave Galloway. Dave Garraway. Garraway, yeah. Dave Garraway. Oh, wow. Early, early uh, morning show host in New York. Really funny, York. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, funny. So you, but your name was J. Frederick? J. Frederick, right. My, 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 my name is J. Frederick Coleman. Okay. And so I just, uh, you know. So he, he, the he, department store. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. And, well, I used to call myself Fredericks of Hollywood on the air. Yeah. That was my. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so you really are. Um, you were weatherman on on NBC mm-hmm. four here mm-hmm. in LA for thirty nine years. Mm-hmm. But what you really wanted to do was stand up and comedy. Well, I did it. I, I, you know, I I, I honestly, uh, for two reasons, took the job in LA. One is that there's no weather, and <laughs> right. I couldn't embarrass myself that much. And second of all, because I could still work as a comic. And even when I was doing the weather, I did the 5, 6, and 11 o'clock news. Between the early and late news, I would go do a set at the Comedy Store, the Improv. I was doing two or three wow. sets a week. Really? And going back, as long as there was no, you know, we didn't have what we're having today. You weren't taking barometric readings? Right no. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Absolutely wow. not. Listen, my whole job as a weatherman on TV in L.A. was to learn how to suffer public humiliation gracefully. That's it. <laughs> Just be, well just apologize said. for your mistakes, and it's all. But, so, but, but weather was always the kind of weather was always the dream gig for local news. Yeah. Because well, it, it wasn't was that, as important back then until climate change. Yeah. We were talking about this earlier. Weather didn't occupy that much uh, pr- uh, of, a, of, a, of a face in the news. I always said that my job as a weatherman during calm weather was to be the palate cleanser between the tragedy and the sports. That's right. Because and, and they actually programmed for that because they were trying to appeal to the entire demographic pie in the news hour. Yeah, yeah. And so the weatherman, the, the weather forecaster was always appealing to the old ladies. Right, yes. so mm-hmm. they would always look to to hire like Storm Fields. Yes, you know they'd always try to hire a, a young, nice, yes. a nice boy. It was the least threatening part of a newscast, yeah. so you could smile and deliver it yeah. with a little warmth. No, you're a hundred percent right. And but, here, by the way, here it is: Supreme Court turns down property rights challenge to rent control in New York and California, which is going to affect the way that landlords uh, can now, you know, especially in negatively, Holy negatively. Cow. Well, it's a, it's a negative. So far as I know, I haven't read the whole thing. Who reads? I mean, there's I, some I people that couldn't afford to live here without rent control. Well, not I mean, everybody can have a three hundred thousand dollar motor coach like uh, Clarence, like the homeless do. Clarence Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all right, Clarence Thomas. Did you see the John Oliver show on Sunday yeah, night? Brilliant. Oh, it was so. See funny. that that was. The, you Did know, you hear about that? No, I've, I've I have a house guest who is actually a guest in our studio. Dan Christ, say hello, Dan. Hi, everybody. Hello, Dan. He he's from the He <laughs> yeah. Represents the Great Pacific Northwest. That's right. And he's a, a radio guy. He's just scoffing oh, at old, our talk old time about this radio rain. Guy. And, and uh, he has been occupying my full time. So I don't know what's well, you know, happening in, in answer the world. To, in answer to the, what we were talking about, the media scape and how bleak yeah, it right, is, right. You know, the, the, the good side of it is we have really, truly brilliant cut-through information, the breakthrough right. information right. from John Oliver. You know, John Stewart's back. Yeah. He's doing a great job. You yeah, know I mean? Yeah. So it's not... You know, I love John Oliver because you learn something as well as laugh hard at the way yeah. he sort of accents yeah, everything. That, it's a real public service. Yeah, you got to see. Yeah, he one, offered one focus. Is he offered so... a check to Clarence Thomas for one million dollars if he would retire. A year. Whoa. He said if, a, a year. year. He said, and 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 it's not HBO paying for it. I'll pay for it. I'll pay you a hundred a million dollars a year if you'll retire. And then he goes out in the garage and he said, plus we'll kick in this two and a half million dollar motor coach. Oh no! Oh my God! <laughs> I don't know. Did he ever? Uh, if if Clarence Thomas had a soul, he'd respond to it because it's uh, he. Yeah. Well, no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, right. well. Do you feel in the current? Um, receding intelligence level in the United States yeah. that 
your group, and it was so smart. I I, I compare it to Mike Nichols and Elaine May. Oh, it was current topics, it, 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 current current topics, and an intelligent uh, mm-hmm. satire about things that are happening in people's lives. I I mean, first of all, you you have the general intelligence level, and I'm not being superior. I'm just talking about what people react to in clubs or in books or in movies. Right. And also the shortening in American attention span. Um, I'm sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> do you feel like it would be harder for you to carve out the same space now if you? Were yeah, I, I, I yes and no. I think that if uh, the entire if group was alive, you know, we lost God bless him, Peter Bergman and Phil Austin, uh, Dave Osman and I. Uh, we're still funny. You know, but we're only half as funny. We're half the wits of the Firesign Theater. The Firesign Theater was a very unique comp- uh, combination of four like-minded people, all of whom had a surrealistic love of comedy, the, like the Goon Shows, really far out uh, b- brain connecting, uh, brain exercising comedy. That's exactly you know? what I'm talking and, about. And, we, and, and the fact that we could do a long form of comedy, we, we created long form comedy albums, uh, was something that people really reveled in. The people who got what we were doing l- enjoyed very much bringing over friends and putting on a 20 minute comedy album, mm-hmm. you know, and turning the lights down and getting stoned and Entering it and being part of it, mm-hmm. and and we took them on this ride. Well, today, there, if if you really look at what's going on, there are people who like Trump who are so satirical, so surrealistic, so insanely comedic that that there's no room for a jester no. anymore. They they are they are satirizing themselves, as you pointed out. Uh, he is very much like an evangelistic preacher, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, and he and he touches the same audience because they've already been conditioned to respond a certain way to that. What really has happened to the world that <clears throat> did not was not happening when Firesign was doing what we were doing. A lot of which was deprogramming. We were trying to deprogram people from commercialism. And from what commercialism did to the way you think, the way you saw things, okay? Because commercialism and television, for the first time, well, no, radio, for the first time, sent out propaganda to to people's homes and could reach all these people. Hitler used radio absolutely brilliantly to propagandize the German nation. And, you know, as he often said, if you say a lie, often enough people will believe it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's the idea of commercials, too. You know, if you smell, you smell bad. Well, I don't smell bad. Well, maybe you will smell bad. So, you know, <laughs> buy this deodorant. Uh, and, and today... Uh, most of the propaganda is now uh, fragmented so that people are talking to their various audiences. Well, that means we've lost that whole audience. When we were doing records, those records were meant for people to take home and listen to privately or share with friends in a dorm room or something. We never dreamed that they would be broadcast, but then FM radio came along and suddenly the entire uh, the metric changed, and we reached even more people, mm-hmm. and we and we were able to reach an intelligent audience that was out there that was hungry for this kind of satirical comedy. And, and before you got to the point of putting it on a record, <clears throat> the 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 atmosphere in clubs and places for you to grow this material yes. was different. It was more free form then too. Very definitely. <clears throat> so. You know, the the Lenny Bruce's and the George Carlin's had to have a free space to be able to grow. They this were new the pioneers. Form. Yeah, yeah. They led. The Way. And I, I just, uh, I, I don't know that we, we, we would have that now. I don't think well, so. Frazier Smith's going to be on the show soon, and he's out among the in the comedy mm-hmm. world. Mm-hmm. You're still out in the comedy mm-hmm. world. Yeah. Now, w- when you do, I know you do a wonderful one-man show, mm-hmm. right? And what are you doing at the El Portal right that's, now? That's, I, uh, I, I call it a residency, for lack of a better term. Uh, we've just been extended for the second time. I'm there once a month through May. Uh, we're there this Sunday, February 25th, and I do a show. I have an opening act for 15 minutes, and then I do about an hour and 15 minutes, uh, which is just the perfect length of time when people in my particular demographic 
old people and their parents have to use the bathroom. So, <laughs> yeah. so I, I, you know, it's an hour and a half show, but it's a lot of fun. And and uh, I, what are your uh, topics? What are you, what are you talking? Well, about? I. I I developed this thing for myself that seemed to work for myself years ago, and I made this title up. I don't know if it, it exists anywhere else. It, a, a single topic monologue. For instance, the uh, first one man show. John Oliver. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the, yeah, w- without, you know, $500,000. Uh, yeah, of course. Writers. It's a big but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, the first one I did was about uh, being a dad uh, from a dysfunctional family, and then I did one about uh, divorce, and then I did one about the news business, and this is my second one about being old. So not every single piece of material is about being old, but it's how an older person, somebody my age, a boomer, is uh, perceiving the world now. It's a lot of fun. And it's easier to write jokes when it's about one topic. Yeah, Do you find the, the, the boomers, are they coming out? They absolutely are. I mean, we've been extended twice for this particular run. And I'm in the smaller theater. I'm in the Marilyn Monroe Forum, which is 100 seats, and that's perfect for me. Great. Right. Yeah. So, Do you have a grill with the dress? I mean, do you wear the dress? Yes. <laughs> no, I, I wear that. <laughs> I see. With a fan underneath it. Well, the reason they call it the Marilyn Monroe Theater, an interesting piece of Southern California lure, is right across the parking lot from the El Portal is North Hollywood Elementary School, where Marilyn was a student. Oh. And so that's huh. why. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I, I worked in the Marilyn Monroe Theater uh, at the uh, uh, at an, in Hollywood. And what was, what's the name of that the studio? Uh, who, who started the uh, actor's studio? Strasburg. Yeah. At the Lee Strasburg Theater, there is a... A Marilyn Monroe right. Theater. Mm-hmm. And I did a play there called L.A. Deli by Sam Bobrick many years ago. So we have that in common. Yeah. Marilyn, that slut. Yeah. She's all, <laughs> all over the place. And, well, but did you, when you were, you don't do stand up now with a bunch of other stand up comics. No, I do the clubs occasionally. You do. But, what's, but what, I, what's the atmosphere out there? Uh, I, you know, I, I'm so old, I just feel like a chaperone when I work the clubs now. <laughs> I, I mean, I, 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 I have nothing to say to 25 year olds who are trying to get laid. I really, yeah. you know, I, I've had some experience, I've made some bad mistakes, and I would like to talk about those. It's a cathartic experience for me. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, uh, teaching those kids something. To yeah, avoid, yeah, right. right? So, so I, I, I do the clubs occasionally, but I, I'm, I like the longer form. But you know, you're absolutely mm-hmm. right that, that most of the topics of the clubs now are about dating and you know finding hooking up. Yeah, They're about hooking up because people are afraid of the divide. Uh, oh yeah, that's a thing. I don't do political stuff, and for two reasons. First of all, the shelf life of current events material is very short. Very true. Second of all, people are so hyper politically correct now. You yeah. don't even have to do a punchline. If you just say Donald Trump on stage, uh, you'll hear. Ooh. I knew we were in a bad place when Jerry Seinfeld, who is probably the cleanest, most centrist comic working, said, "I don't want to do." colleges anymore because they're too sensitive. I remember that. That was a while ago, too. Yeah, yeah that was a long wow. time ago. Yeah. That's right. Well, hey, you know, but I, I, I mean, you know, I'm an internal optimist. There is a lot of things still happening. I mean, Fire Sign Theater wasn't a mass appeal comedy. It, it appealed to a, a, a smaller select sector. of. That's m- right. And uh, it, it was for those of people who don't know what Fire Sign Theater is, four-man satirical comedy group. Uh, that started in the late 60s uh, on the radio, yeah. all over the radio here, here in town. in this station. Yeah, right here in KPFK. And we actually started in the parking lot where this building now stands because that was where the original KPFK station was. And they tore it down and built a parking lot and, <laughs> and then <laughs> built this nice new big building, which has now been sold out from under our feet. So, And life goes on. But Fire Sign Theater started here, and actually it, it may even end here for all I know. But, I but, mean, I think, I think you know, the, the things are so strange. The divide is so intense. We are one old man health crisis away from having a very frightening scenario. Yeah. It's scary times, and usually that really cultivates great humor. Kimmel and uh, Colbert and Seth Meyers yes, they're are the doing gestures, incredible they're the work. They're the gestures of the nation. Every, and John Oliver, mm-hmm. John Stewart, they're all out there, but those three guys are doing it 
like five nights a week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like, that's a reason why uh, other comedians in the clubs don't do it because it's being done about as well as it can be it's done very on true. TV. As good as it gets. Yeah. And, and what they're really doing, because the news environment has been so fractured and compromised, mm-hmm. that a lot of people, you know, we've been reading this for years, that many, many people get their primary news from comedians mm-hmm. because they can't deal with the, the temperature. Too and depressing. That. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I, we were talking on the way over. I, I don't listen to commercial radio, but I wanted to hear what was going on with the weather, so I listened to KNX on mm-hmm. the way over here for the hourly and the spots leading up. It was just ugly. It was ugly mm-hmm. and dark and mm-hmm. full of fear, both commercial yeah. and editorially. Yeah, they were and, talking about a, a $50,000 BMW that had spots on the hood from the rain. <laughs> oh, and was that an attorney? Part of the Stormwatch. Oh, of course. Yeah, attorney ad, right? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh. when I was on jury service last week, um, I was there... You were actually in jury jail yeah, from I was, the stories you told me about. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Thank you. You're welcome. I, Thank I was, you for your not service. I was fulfilling my duty of keeping the litigation industrial complex alive uh, <laughs> by having uh, high-powered uh, lawyers milking easy targets. Oh, and uh, The story you tell about for that For big hysterical. money. But you yeah. can't talk about it now because the Can't talk about it because the, the trial is still... still going on. But when it's over... Yeah, you'll hear some hair-raising stories. Yeah, yeah. All right. So anyway, to 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 cut to the end of what you're saying, uh, there there was a place for us, and we were not h- highly political. In fact, we were more anarchistic, if mm-hmm. you will. Mm-hmm. We we didn't take sides, mm-hmm. which allowed us to expose what was crazy about politics, uh, in general, if you will. Uh, although we did break the president. You know, we predicted that Nixon would be tossed out mm-hmm. and things like that. And we were futurists. We used the, the vehicle that we had and the, the ears that we found out there to talk about what might happen because of how we were living now, now. I wasn't even talking – when I asked you that question, I wasn't talking about your ability to do the political stuff. It's just the ability to use your brain. And, and to reach and other to brains. Do the, and, do, right. and, and do the long form stuff that you guys were so good at. I, you know, people are saying, we have the short American attention span. Yeah. That killed the news when they gave people a clicker. And I used to, when I started the five o'clock news, I, I had five minutes of time at five o'clock. And then over time, it was whittled down to a minute and a half or two minutes because people are at home doing this. And That's they're right. so deathly afraid that you're going to bore them for 10 seconds. We predicted that in our best selling album, Don't Crush That Dwarf, Hand Me the Pliers. <laughs> where we basically <laughs> invented surfing, channel surfing. Click, click. That's right. You know, we used it as a, as a, yeah. a comedic tool and as a dramatic tool to be able to go from one place instantly to another, mm-hmm. which is what was happening in people's homes, even mm-hmm. though they had to walk up to the television and go, mm-hmm. gunk, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. And we knew it was, going to, it was going to affect the way people well, thought. And then, and then you multiply that by unlimited channels. Oh my and, God! And you, it's Our Procter just, and Bergman. We we predicted that in uh, what was the name of that album? TV or not TV? We predicted there were going to be hundreds of channels, you know. But I didn't realize. So there you're would the be cause thousands. of all this. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> well, you know, but when we did our, when when we were producing hourly newscasts, network hourly newscasts, I mean, yeah. we had to tell. We had the A block and the B block is what it's called. And the first 90 seconds of, an, of like a CBS hourly newscast yeah. is 90 seconds long. I mean, may, things may have changed. And we knew that most of the affiliate stations would tune out for after that. After that. Mm-hmm. And so we had to say what was going on in the world in 90 seconds. Mm-hmm. Then wow. we had a luxurious two and a half minutes in the B block to do, a, oh, you know, so a little specific. kicker to make people feel good. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe some, 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 something insightful for 20 seconds. Mm-hmm. And, and that was the world as represented. Mm-hmm. It was really a great lesson in effic- information efficiency. Yes. But that's what, you know, speaking of media, that's where I learned yeah. the concept that like a river, the more shallow it is, the faster it is. The deeper it is, that's the slower it is. So when we're doing, now this was pre-cable. So we're doing hourly newscasts. People depended on hourly newscasts, right? So yes, we, were, we, we were fast. We were the fastest news delivery system out there. But by, by necessity, we were also the most shallow. 
mm-hmm. and then you would wait for the next day for the New York Times to come out and have a nice deep look yes. at it. Yes, and, and, that, and that, that, that's a wonderful point. And, and uh, one of the things that people complain to me the most about the news because they feel like um, I'm going to deliver this information to somebody who can make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anybody above the second floor. But, um, <laughs> but um, the, 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 the shortening American attention span is really a disservice to people because what it does is uh, the important topic, the A-block topic, it's in the A-block because it's the most, somebody deemed it the most important story of the day. So that should have... Uh, you know, some it, in-depth reporting. It, it should have some in-depth reporting, and mm-hmm. common sense says it should have a little time to breathe. Right. No, it's a minute or a ninety seconds, and then you're out, and it's it do, it doesn't even do the topic service. Well, it's like I said before when we were talking. It's like it's uh, even the nightly newscasts now, the half hours. Mm-hmm. It's all rhyme, no reason. There's no yeah. time for reason. If you watch maybe a PBS news hour, you get some reason. Yeah. But when they're when you're so hyper accelerated like that, it's all rhyme. Clicks, fear, bad news, and yes. no time for reason or any kind of digestion. And that's really bad news because 100%. What, what? Yeah, because since we're now living in these news bubbles, the people who want to watch Fox TV all the time will not watch anything, any mainstream television. To me, that's the scariest not, aspect of where we are right yeah. now. There, uh, for instance. The 1-6 testimony on television, which was riveting and I think of great value to clear-thinking Americans, yeah. but the people who should see that information that might have their minds changed or siloed off on Fox or Stay Newsmax, nobody, nobody, nobody even knew that was occurring. That's right. But what I'm also saying is that since the news that people of, of intelligence are watching is, has been adumbrated and, you know, and degraded... It, in its terms of its presentation and what it talks about, it's not doing a fair job mm-hmm. for for those of us who really want to know what the reality can, yeah, is. It's out there, but it's, it's but it's, yeah. it's still entertainment, you know. Yeah. They're uh, scare. They're trying to scare us, you know, or they're trying to amuse us, you know. And at the at, but at the same time, anybody with intelligence who's watching this is going like. Oh my God! Look what's happening. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, it's going to be. I think it's. I mean, besides the scary part of the, the danger involved, this is going to be the most entertaining year. No, oh, yeah. I mean, See, there's there some satisfaction to yeah. Donald Trump still being in the line of fire as he's going down. I can't believe we're still talking about this guy. Yeah. I, well, I, that's what really, he. That's what he lives for. I, I, and I know. I, I. I'm just so flabbergasted he, entertainment yeah. well speaking He's of very which, entertaining yes this was so entertaining we're out of time oh man and great thank you for coming oh, back man. it was such a Fritz great Coleman. it was a great conversation about many things and i love you guys and keep up the good work i want to come see your boomer show you'll yeah, come and see tell us tell, can see where it. can people see your show it, it's at the el portal theater it's this iconic old theater in, that, in what part of town in the north hollywood right. on lancashire boulevard it's right. right across the street from the lamely theater beautiful theater. and it's um it, it's uh, they started as a vaudeville house. Bob Hope, Red Buttons all performed oh, there. I didn't then know it that. became a movie house, and and uh, and uh, so what's the name of the theater? Is El, El Portal, Portal Theater. Go to elportaltheater dot com. Get tickets. We'll be there through May. Will you come back uh, anytime? Thanks. You've for been listening to uh, Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. I'm Ted Bonnet. I'm Phil Proctor. Our guest today, Fritz Coleman. And uh, our we'll, guest in the studio, Dan Christ. We'll see you Dan next. Uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks Love so much you. for listening. Stay dry. Thank you.